Hi, everybody. My name is Kelsey Nichols, and welcome to Introduction to Composting with TREE, the Thames Region Ecological Association. Uh, we'll get going in a couple of minutes. First, I just wanted to welcome you. Uh, you're joining us through GoToWebinar. You're in a listen-only mode with your cameras off. Um, if you can just do a favor and stay muted so that uh, we avoid background noise. Um, there is a question box where you're able to ask questions at any time. So we'll answer them um, pretty much throughout. So um, just feel free to ask them anytime. And also, just so you know, we are recording this webinar. So if you can't stay the whole time, uh, it'll get sent to you in a day or two. But uh, yeah, all right. So I'll just introduce myself to get started. So I'm moderating this evening. Uh, like I said, my name is Kelsey Nichols, and uh, so I'm the Signal Boost Coordinator with Reforest London. If you're not familiar with them, we're a local environmental uh, charitable nonprofit that aims to enhance the environmental and human health of the forest city through the benefits of trees. So we're well known for planting trees, giving trees away, um, but we're also the founders of the new Westminster Pond Center for Environment and Sustainability. So this exciting new project is a community hub that's going to be um, about environmental excellence and promoting sustainability and health and well-being in our region. Um, and so eventually we're going to have numerous free educational events at the center. Uh, but during COVID, we are uh, doing these educational events through webinars. And so that's the Signal Boost Initiative. That's the name of this program. And actually tonight um, is our 15th webinar already. Um, so actually, I'll put up a poll just to see how many of you are returning people. So as you can tell, we've been partnering with a huge uh, list of different local nonprofits and just environmental groups, which has been really exciting to be able to offer such a diversity of workshops. So um, today is all about composting. And if you enjoy it, um, next week, there's one about how to bike to work from the London Cycle Link. And then there's an intensive permaculture full day workshop on Sunday, July 26th. And then we're working with growing chefs to do a live cooking workshop using wild foods. And also, as always, I'll mention if you go to reforestlondon.ca, you can find all the events listed there. And you'll also find Seeds to Forest Homeschool Edition, which is our um, at-home program for kids with a lot of free nature activities you can do. So to keep the kids busy. Um, and if you ever have any questions, you can just email me at signalboost at reforestlondon.ca. So first, I'm just going to do a quick poll of, have you attended a Signal Boost webinar before, yes or no? So I'll put that up for a moment. All right, thanks for answering, everybody. Most people have responded. So 71% said no. There we go. Thanks for that. Okay, so now before we begin, I'm just going to introduce our speaker. So, uh, Caitlin Lyons is a past tree board member or board director. As a recent MSc graduate in biology at Western University, her research focused on plant soil interactions in boreal peatlands. Specifically, this was to study um, how, the study of how varying plant and soil microbial communities affect ecosystem processes such as decomposition. And in the fall, she's starting her PhD at Wilfrid Laurier University. So she really knows her stuff about compost, that's for sure. So welcome, Caitlin, and I'll pass it over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kelsey. I appreciate that. Um, let me just, there we go. Perfect. So I'll just start off talking a little bit about TREE. So TREE is the Thames Region Ecological Association. It's a non -profit for profit charity that was actually formed back in 1986. So it's been in London for quite some time. And our goal is to educate members and the community to protect the environment, stay informed and take personal action on things like waste reduction, active transportation, and action against climate change. So generally what TREE does is we have workshops similar to this where we invite members of the community to come and learn about different topics. And we try to have a good variety of topics available based on different interests. 
So for instance, we've had presentations talking about small things you can do around your house to kind of make your home more environmentally friendly, such as like reducing energy or uh, water consumption. Um, we've also had um, workshops focusing on things like climate disasters and kind of how you can prepare yourself for those types of issues and situations. Um, and generally in the summer, we're quite active. We take a lot of pride in attending a lot of the festivals that London puts on as a city, so Sunfest and Home County. And we'll basically take a lead role here in manning some of the waste stations, so helping people to properly sort their waste, to divert as much waste as we can during these festivals. So that's some of the um, goals and things like that that TREE has. So I just wanted to advertise that to all of you in case you're more interested in finding out a little bit more about what TREE does. So I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, Kelsey did say that I just finished my master's in biology. So I focused a lot on uh, boreal peatlands. And one thing that's really great about peatlands is they're made of peat, which is this partially decomposed organic matter, which is basically all this partially decomposed plant material. And it's all partially decomposed. That means all the carbon that was in the plants are now being stored in the soil. So we're seeing very slow rates of decomposition, meaning a lot of carbon is stored in the soil versus released the atmosphere. And actually peatlands store about one third of the world's terrestrial carbon, but they only cover about 3% of the globe. So, and I studied a lot about the plants and the microbes and how climate change is interacting with um, decomposition processes. So I really like talking about composting because I've taken a lot of time to study kind of the ecological background towards um, composting. And one thing I really just like to highlight, and it's this presentation is normally very discussion based because composting is an art. There's not one way to do it. And so it's really about trial and error and making things work. And that's because it's a natural process, right? So and there's a lot of different factors and players involved and we'll get into a little bit of those today. Um, but yeah, please, if you have questions or comments, feel free to write it in the chat. More than happy to talk about them. And yeah, so in September, I'll be starting my PhD, still talking a lot and researching a lot about decomposition, but more so focusing on how permafrost thaw, so up in the Arctic of Canada, is kind of playing into decomposition processes. So I might want to start off with um, one question that Kelsey has ready on the poll, and that's how many of you compost at home right now, just out of curiosity. All right, answers are streaming in. Most people have responded. So far we're at 65% say yes already. Okay, lots of current composters. Awesome. So all of you probably already know so much about what works for you and we'll probably have good suggestions on what might work for other people as well. There we go. I'm just sharing the results up there. Most people had responded. So 65% yes, 23% no, and 12% I have in the past. Awesome. Yes, so we'll start a little bit about talking about what is composting. So it, composting is your end product from decomposition, which is the, the breakdown of organic material. So this happens through soil microbes. So it can happen through soil microbes and the soil arthropods that are there as well. It's a very um, in, like complicated process with lots of players and basically decomposition is just the breakdown into smaller particles, right? So you have a larger piece of organic matter it's being reduced down to a smaller piece of organic matter and through that process we're getting the recycling of nutrients and that's being released back into the soil environment. So when you're composting, you want to speed up the process of decomposition so you can get your end product, which is that compost. 
And to do that, you need to maintain appropriate conditions for your soil decomposers, so for your soil microbes and microarthropods and things like that. And there's about four things that you really need to take into consideration when you're starting a compost, and that's moisture, temperature, oxygen, and nutrients. And there's no right answer for any of these factors. It's all about finding a balance and making sure that environment is as happy as it can be for those soil microbes. So then once through the process of decomposition, your end product is this compost that's super nutrient rich and it can be used um, to condition your soil and things like that. So it's a really great natural process that where you can divert some of your home waste and really end up with this good usable product at the end. So some of the benefits of composting including include you can lay it down as mulch around your shrubs and your trees and similar to mulch it acts like a barrier kind of keeping in that soil moisture and um, it also um, releases some nutrients to the soil below helping the trees and the shrubs grow it's great to spread your compost across your soil for in your vegetable and your flower gardens so one thing I always like to talk about when I'm, I explain how you can use your compost in your gardens is there's, it, it's, there's not a universal answer about what time of year is the best time to apply your compost to your garden. It's about the type of compost that you're using. So if your compost is kind of still in the beginning stages, so there's still some large um, pieces or large green material that you can actually see. Um, it's important to note that the microorganisms are still being, are quite busy at work. So a lot of the nitrogen is locked up still in the um, microbes. So it's important then to, if you have compost of that quality, still pretty new, it's not fully broken down yet, that at uh, that point it's best to lay that compost in your vegetable garden in the autumn so it has a bit more time to break down and release those nutrients so then come the springtime you'll have some really good nutrients additions to your soil um, for your vegetable and your flower gardens whereas if your compost is bit much more darker more broken down you can lay that down whenever you want. So at the beginning of the season to give your plants a good boost, midway in the season when that compost is ready, it doesn't matter too much. And another great benefit of compost is you can also use it in your house plants. If your house plants needs some new nutrient addition because it is a closed system, it's great and it's also good to use in your planter boxes that's another great thing you can do with compost um something that people talk about sometimes is compost tea so you can make that if you'd like it's simply using your compost material you can put it in a burlap sap sack and you can let it soak in water and then you can apply that water to your gardens and it's kind of like this nutrient rich water um, and it's an okay thing to do with your compost it's I wouldn't always recommend it because not all of the nutrients are going to be leached so that's the process where any of the dissolvable compounds are dissolving into the water um, so not all of the nutrients are going to go into the water. Some is a lot actually is still going to be locked up inside the solid part of the compost. But um, some people really like doing it and they see a lot of benefits. So it's really whatever works for you. And um, some people also choose to use it as a top dressing on their lawn, kind of giving your grass a good boost at the beginning of the season, repairing some of that damaged part of your lawn. The list is really endless and not only are you diverting waste, you're getting a great product at the end that you can use in multiple different ways. 
So just kind of going back to talking about those four factors that impact decomposition. So basically those four factors that are going to impact how long and the quality of compost you're going to get. So if you think about what you're adding to your compost, that's going to play a big role into the type of compost you get at the end. So the quantity and the quality of the material that you're adding. The temperature. Soil microbes are living things, so they have an optimum or an ideal temperature for them to complete their processes at. So it's important to take into account um, that you're trying to play within an appropriate range of temperature for these soil microbes. Moisture is a big one. A lot of people struggle with having the right amount of moisture. Too much and you're just not going to get very fast decomposition. If it's too dry, again, decomposition is going to be very inhibited. So you won't, it'll take longer to get that compost. And also the microbes. So the type of microbes that are there. A lot of people, when you're first starting your compost, you forget that you've got to kind of introduce some soil microbes. So it's really important to take some neighboring soil from your backyard or garden or whatever and introduce that to your compost to kind of kickstart it so there's already some established soil microbes that are there to get your compost started. So um, another thing that people really like to talk about when you're starting your compost is your greens versus your browns and that's really the key. You, if you have the right amount of the green material, the right amount of brown material, that's when you're going to get those ideal conditions to make compost. So the saying is one part green to three parts brown. So greens are all of your living things and so your vegetable scraps, any living plants that you want to get rid of and things like that. Whereas your browns are the more of the dead part. So things like your paper, um, some of your yard waste, so in the fall, all those fallen leaves, some twigs and stuff like that. So it's a lot of people will just start putting all their organics and those are just so high in nutrients. That's when you're going to start getting things like mold happening and stuff like that. You really need the brown material to help make um, keep the soil microbes happy and get that right ratio. Water, your soil moisture, that's super important as well. Again, not too wet, not too dry. Oxygen, that's a super easy one. You just want to make sure you're turning over your pile every once in a while. Temperature, a little bit harder to regulate, but that will depend on the seasonality and also thinking about where to place your compost. If you're putting it in your backyard or your house, like you can kind of be strategic about where you place it. Maybe don't place it right in the sun, maybe a little bit in the shade, things like that, and size. So if you have the right, if you're making a compost pile, the right size is key as well, because then it'll, as the soil microbes are decomposing and creating compost, they create heat. So you want a large enough pile that's creating some heat, but you don't want too big of a pile that's creating a lot of heat, because then it's detrimental to the process as well. So those are some of the players that you gotta keep in mind when you're starting your compost. And again, there's no right or wrong way, essentially. It's just finding the balance and kind of tweaking things here and there and finding what works for you. It's so like there's not an exact temperature or an exact amount of moisture. It's just trying to keep those in mind when you're composting or starting your compost. So if you're finding your compost is taking a really long time to get to that really nice, dark, rich um, material, maybe you need to adjust one of these factors. Um, so uh, sorry. So you want to make sure that you're turning over your um, compost and you're making sure that it's well ventilated. 
and well mixed and that's just making allowing the microbes to get the oxygen that they need to survive so every once in a while turning over your compost is a very good idea um, another um, good thing to keep in mind is the smaller the material when you start the faster your compost happens because then it's already past a couple stage stages right so if you're putting like a really large piece of food scraps it's got all the soil microbes and the microarthropods or have to physically break that down right and that could take a lot longer if the size is bigger so it always helps if you can kind of cut up some of your material that's true with your lawn waste as well getting it into those smaller pieces can really speed along the process Hey Lynn, we have a question that came in. Oh, so perfect. how far down should you turn the compost? That's a question from Steph. Um, that's a great question. And I don't think there's a wrong, I would go as far as you can, like as far to the, don't like start going down into the soil that's already established, but as far down as you can. And that way um, you're getting like an even, um, um, even process of decomposition throughout your entire compost but another thing that some people like to do is they like their compost to build on itself so those are a couple of the options I find a lot of people prefer to have one pile thoroughly mix it all the way through and then once that pile is really full they'll have another pile that they'll start and they'll just mix that one and the other piles where they're adding their new material too. So I would go quite far down if you can. Actually, I'm just curious. Um, so if you didn't want the product as quickly or something, could you control that by turning it over less often? Or is there you know, a, a danger of not turning it over uh, uh, frequently enough? Um, again, it, um, I would say you could just leave it and that should generally be fine. But again, it really depends on what type of material you're putting in. So if you're putting in a lot of food scraps, um, you might get things like mold starting to happen. So if you're constantly adding a lot of food scraps and your green is getting a little bit too high compared to your brown, it's definitely really important to keep turning it over. But if you are maintaining your green and brown ratio pretty well, you could just leave it and it can just do its thing and take its time and it also depends on how you've built your compost as well so if it's like like this picture here it's like mesh along the sides a little bit right so that kind of helps it stay aerated as well it's so hard with composting because there's no right or wrong answer it's it's kind of just tweaking things and doing the best you can <laughs> Great. Uh, oh, another question came in from Jacqueline. Can you speak a bit more about the soil microbes uh, when you mentioned adding soil from your own garden to start? So how did you do that? Um, yeah, it's basically just like inoculating, right? Um, the system because soil microbes are everywhere. Um, so it's just then if you just want to start composting and you have your lawn waste and you have your green waste and you're putting it in your compost there's you don't have to add some soil and i'm not saying add a lot of soil just like you know a shovel full or something like that and you're already introducing those healthy microbes to the system and they'll populate the rest of it but even if you aren't adding some soil they'll get there eventually right because they're they're everywhere. There's soil microbes on the soil right below your compost. So, yeah, um, there's no harm in doing it versus not. It's just sometimes it can give a nice kickstart to your system. Another great thing is if you have a neighbor that already has some really good compost, having a little bit of that compost because those soil microbes have they're well established they've got a nice healthy environment and they'll help populate the rest of your compost that i find really can kickstart your composting as well 
I think that sort of answered a question from Anne, which was, can you just throw some compost from the bottom on the top? Um, so I guess, yeah, just adding more fully formed compost can help. Um, we have one more question and then maybe we'll move on after that. So someone said they've had a composter for four years and it hasn't resulted any in any black compost yet. And she thinks it's because there hasn't been enough uh, brown. So, uh, but she added a lot of sawdust this spring. So even if she hasn't added a lot in a while, um, if she just keeps turning it now, should it eventually work out? Yeah, for sure. Like it still might take some time because you got to keep an eye on those ratios. But yeah, I wouldn't give up. It, it takes time. But yeah, it, it's it's not like the system is shutting down and doesn't work. It's this system is so fluid. So you just kind of it's working and it's moving, but it, it's moving very slowly and not in the direction you want it to. It doesn't mean it's not going to work. So I, I would definitely keep trying and I think she should have some good results. Oh, yes. And Anne mentioned, I read it takes two to three months to get compost. To get yeah, compost. for sure. That's probably a pretty good key point for this type of climate in the summertime. If you're getting a lot of those factors in some way of the right range, for sure, that sounds about a good time frame to me. And someone mentioned, um, can you put weeds in your compost and grass cuttings? Does that count as kind of the, the brown or green? Um, that it's technically green because they are like living. They haven't quite died yet, but if so they still have a lot of nutrients in their um, bodies, right? But if you've like dug them up and left them in your bucket next to your garden for a couple of days and then they've started to wilt that it would count more as brown um but it's definitely not as green as an apple core right it's not going to have the same amount of nutrients as an apple core one so um what was the other part of that question oh could she add that to the compost you can add that to the compost one thing that is always good to keep in mind is that the weeds they're very resilient, right? So they could just decide that's a super happy environment and start growing in your compost. So I wouldn't worry too much about it, but it could happen. <laughs> Good point. All right. There's a few other questions about types of composters, but I think you'll probably get to that a little later. So maybe we can get back to those. For sure. And the audience probably has more ideas than I do. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't love this slide, but it's always a good kind of discussion point in terms of what should you put in your compost and what shouldn't you put in your compost, because a lot of things are organic, right, and they are biodegradable and they will break down. It's just important to keep in mind what, if you're attracting some, like, rodents and things like that. A lot of people don't want a raccoon making their compost a big mess. So things like uh, meat products and dairy products are staying away from those is always a good idea. It generally does help with some rodent issues. Um, and then also pet waste, often not a good idea because you just, there could be some parasites or something like that in your pest weights and you're not entirely sure what's in there and right whatever you're putting in your compost you're introducing to your compost and then you're going to put that on your vegetable garden so it's, i don't know i personally wouldn't really want some pet waste in my compost but i mean if it works for you and you've been doing it for years keep doing it um another thing that people often don't think about is like diseased plants you don't want to introduce that disease to your compost. Not all of the plant diseases that plants get are transferable and will like the environment that they're being introduced to in the compost, but it's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind for sure. Um, oh, grease and oil, that's another big one. 
that can just play around with the soil moisture thing and really just wreak habit on if you have your compost that's at a good moisture level, adding grease and oil can kind of complicate that process. And then it also can be super attractive to rodents and things like glossy paper, right? If you your paper's glossy, it's got that plastic coating, it's gonna be more, uh, it's gonna take a lot longer to break down and those plastic fibers are now going to be in your compost. So again, I'm not saying don't ever put this in your compost. If it works for you, it works for you, but it's just some things to keep in mind if you're just starting and stuff like that. Um, some things we've already talked about, waste reduction, super great with composting. It's always, I love composting because then my garbage doesn't stink and I have so much less garbage and don't have to put it out that often. So that's a great plus. Also, it produces less methane compared to landfills, even though, because a lot of soil microbes are methanogens. So when they do respire, they respire methane, which is greenhouse gas, but it is less than what's found in landfills. It's good for your soil structure, it can increase plant growth, it can also help with like any soil pathogens and stuff like that if you're struggling there because you're introducing all these really healthy um, soil microbes to your gardens and they can generally kind of outcompete some of those pathogens and keep them at bay. And it, you can reduce the need of commercial fertilizers, which is also great in watering because you're adding some of that really nice, moist, organic um, compost. So that's helpful too. Yeah, so I'm not an expert at all when it comes to types of composting because I haven't tried them all. But if you're working in a, an apartment building, so yes, I wanted to ask an, uh, that poll question. How many people compost inside versus outside? And that'll kind of dictate how, um, which direction I put the rest of the presentation towards. Thanks, Kelsey. So 83% outside, 17% inside. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so if you're composting inside, it's all the same factors, just smaller scale coffee filled uh, coffee um, cans a lot of people use those and just add some holes to the top obviously you're working on a much smaller scale i've seen some people use milk crates and you can kind of stack them and they've like lined them with wood and so then once your top one's full they rotate it to the bottom and that's kind of one way to increase how much composting you can do inside Burmy composters. I've never done it, but I have friends who have had success with it, and it's not too hard. I've read about it on the internet a lot. It's super interesting. So that's definitely another option for inside. One thing that's kind of fun to talk about is digesters. Likely most of you don't do this, but it's if you're com like you're essentially decomposing your organic material in an anoxic environment. That means very, very low oxygen. Um, so it's releasing greenhouse gases such as methane because methanogens love anoxic environments. They love it. And you can capture these greenhouse gases and you can use them as fuel. So some corporations do this and I think there's I forget the name of the one composting company in London but I know they do this to a certain extent it's always just kind of fun tidbit of information so here are a couple options um the black one here you can turn yourself which um like from the outside you don't need to use a fork or anything so a lot of people like that and it has two chambers so you can have like one chamber for you're not adding organics to this anymore and the other chamber you are and you're just letting that one chamber kind of get to that dark rich stage so that's great about that the cone um is not going to really produce compost it's kind of double heated so it's supposed to get really nice and warm and it's supposed to break down super quickly but it's supposed to actually like break down all the way 
Um, I don't have much experience with this one, and but basically it's like since it's so warm because it's double walled, um, a lot of the material um, is leached out as water to the surrounding environment. So these are kind of just some alternatives to your typical compost pile for those black bins. Um, so now I'm just going to get into um, a little bit about composting in the fall versus winter versus spring versus summer. And the idea is not necessarily changing your practices. It's just some things to keep in mind that people often forget because different times of years we as people do different things and that can really affect our compost as well. So one thing in the fall is people often want to put all of their yard waste in their compost, which is great, but you got to kind of keep that back of your mind, that brown to green ratio. And another thing that if you have a lot of yard waste, it's awesome if you can leave some of that around your house because that's really good habitat for some insects over the winter. So then you don't have to put it all in your compost. So that's a great alternative for some of your yard waste. And just you can take some of those plants that have finished fruiting and producing your vegetables or flowers for the year. Those can definitely be added to your compost. And just keep in mind, they might be kind of brown and they might be kind of green when you're thinking about your ratio. And just again, making sure your compost is super well mixed. Um, I've never done this either, but it's people have brought it up as discussion points in the past is leaf pile composting. So it's, the idea is if you make your pile the right size and you can kind of put it in the right spot where it's happy and the leaves should decompose because they are like the leaves, if they're outside, they do have little microarthropods and other types of decomposers on them. So that's the idea there. I as soon as I buy a house, I'm definitely going to try this because I'm super interested. But the um, dimensions here are kind of what people in the past have said are the ideal. So three feet high by four feet across. So it's always interesting to think about. Um, in the winter, your compost is definitely going to slow down. Your compost production is because the soil microbes are temperature dependent, right? So if it's too cold, they're not being active. They're not breaking down your organic material. But it doesn't mean you still can't compost. So if you can get your pile to be that right size, it's going to still be creating heat, right? So because the soil microbes are active and as they're breaking things down, they release heat. And if you can get it so they're releasing that right amount of heat to keep things still warm in the wintertime, you, you could still have some pretty um, good decomposition occurring. So that's um, through the insulate, that's kind of how that's working, right? Your, the compost is kind of insulating itself. Um, one thing I always like to do because it's cold outside and I'm a little bit lazy is I'll just put my compost in the freezer and then when I get, I generally use a mixing bowl and then when it's full, that's when I bring it outside to my compost. So that's always a good option there if you want to keep trying to compost through the winter months. Yes, so if you can find that right size of pile. So some people have told me three feet by three feet, but again, that's a different size could work very well for someone else. And then you can maybe still have some active decomposition occurring through the winter months. Probably still will be very slow, but it's possible. Um, spring, sometimes people forget about all the spring melt, so you're introducing a lot of extra soil moisture through the system with all the extra rain that's occurring and all the snow that's melting. So I find if you're at that point, if you can find some of that yard waste you kept along your yard to insulate, provide some habitat for the insects, if you can introduce that to your compost at that time of year, that can really soak up some of that moisture and that's an excellent time if you have some really good compost to add to your gardens to kind of kick start things but 
Again, if it's that dark, rich stage, you can add it whenever you want. It's no harm adding it this time of year. It's still going to help your system. Summer, again, the moisture could be a little bit higher due to humidity. That extra brown material could be helpful. You want to make sure you're keeping things well aerated so you're not seeing mold and other things like that growing. And it also really helps with the smell, I find as well. And that's pretty much all I had to talk about. Um, if there's any more questions, definitely you can ask them now. Um, if you want to look up some more information about tree, this is our website. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. There's actually a ton of questions coming in, so keep them coming, um, which is nice that we have a lot of time for that. Yeah, and I believe they have a lot more upcoming events too. So definitely check out that their website. Yes, uh, and more resources. For oh, sure. I forgot that tree also has a demonstration site. So our office is at Grosvenor Lodge on Western Road. So we have a compost demonstration site there. There's a pollinator garden. It's a really nice property. So if you're ever in the area, you can check that out. And yeah, so here are some of the um, events we have lined up for the future. Nice. All right. Well, if we go back, someone asked about, can you put a compost in a plastic bin? I believe a lot of composters are made of plastic, eh? Oh, for sure. You definitely, if you want to keep it contained, Plastic is great because that plastic's not going to break down, right? Like wood, you can use wood too. If you make like a wooden crate, that'll totally work. But over time, that wood will break down unless it's treated. But yeah, plastic is great for that. Thanks. All right, pretty specific question, but can you put flavored coffee in your vermicompost? So I guess it's things with more lots of flavors, maybe slightly artificial flavors, um, stuff like that. Yeah, um, I would start with a little bit and see how it goes. You can always try just a little bit. Um, definitely um, avoid some of the coffee filters because I know some of them have plastic in them. But I would just try a little bit and see how it goes. It could be fun. <laughs> Then along the same lines of having a vermicomposter, how do you winter the worms? Oh, if you keep them inside your house, they should be happy there, right? Um, so I can talk a little bit more about vermicomposting. So it's great if you have two bins, like two Rubbermaid tubs, and you put one inside the other, and you put holes in, in the inside one, and you have a nice bedding of like shredded paper, and things like that and then you add your worms some starter soil and you have your organics that you're mixing in and then as soon as that bedding is gone like kind of disappeared that's when your compost is ready to be harvested and that's kind of when you gotta restart so then you'll take a little bit of the compost that you just created make sure you're getting some of those worms and you introduce it to your next bin um, maintaining moisture is hard, but if you have the holes drilled in the one Rubbermaid tub, if you accidentally add a little bit too much, things would be okay. But yeah, they should be perfectly happy throughout the winter, as long as they're inside. Nice. So somebody said he basically made his own tumbler uh, by drilling holes in a garbage can and put the lid on and he rolls it on his lawn. <laughs> so does that kind of have the same effect as a tumbler? Um, yeah. I mean, if it works, it works. Like, people are ingenious, I've told you. People have way more ideas than I do. <laughs> <laughs> there, you, there you go, new idea for other people. Mm -hmm. Just uh, don't accidentally bring out the garbage. Yes. <laughs> do, do, do. Do, do, do. Someone said, I inherited a cone composter with our house. There was plastic inside it, and that's not encouraged. So, like you said, it's not good to have plastic in it but i guess if you have it i guess you'd probably just try and pull it out if you can for sure like hopefully there's not too much if you can get some of it out like that's great but 
I find now plastic is so ubiquitous everywhere. Like, you're going to, if you even went to this, like a garden center and you bought some nice compost, you're going to find little pieces of plastic because things like the sticker on your fruit, like those can often end up mm -hmm. in your compost accidentally. So it, it's really hard to completely eliminate it, but do your best and I'm sure it'll be fine. I make my composters out of pallets and old crates. Is oh, is there wood that is not good? Um, I'm. I actually don't know. I could imagine that some, like you would want some treated wood generally, so it wouldn't break down the same. But maybe some of the chemicals and what they use to treat the wood kind of could be harmful. I, not an expert, but I. I love seeing that set up when people do the crates. It's super cool looking. So good for them. Thanks. Um, if you have a rolling composter, what would you suggest as an insulator? So if you wanted to add an insulator to it. Hmm. Basically, so they can keep it going during the winter time. Hmm. Some straw would probably be good, but it I imagine that'd be very hard in the tumbler because it's spinning and because yeah a, what a lot of people do if they have piles is they'll put some straw or some yard waste just kind of around the outside of the compost of the compost pile and that can kind of keep some of the heat that's generated from the microbes in the pile but I, I really don't know that's a super great question if someone from the audience has a great idea feel free to <laughs> jump in. Okay, next one. Thoughts on using a large Rubbermaid container with a lid outside, just throwing a Tupperware container out there. Does that work? Um, I, I would, it could, it definitely could. Um, I mean, I would probably drill some holes, just not on the top, maybe like around, um, like at the top part of the outside, just because know how those black bins, they generally have some slots along the outside. So I would just drill a couple holes around the top part of the outside of it, just to kind of help with some airflow. And because it's a closed system, you'll want to try to make sure you're introducing some really good soil microbes. So then I would probably suggest if you have a neighbor or a friend who has a good compost pile, kind of taking some of their compost and inoculating yours with it. Okay, great. Are there any other examples of brown materials other than the, one, the ones you mentioned? Eggs, cartons, paper, any of that like dead organic material, right? So Cardboard theoretically could work too, but it's a lot of it's probably painted with some sort of plastic coating on it. But yeah, paper and um, egg curtains are a good one as well. Um, Eggshells would definitely kind of count as some of that brown material. Yeah, there's probably lots of others that I just can't think of at this moment. But. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, if my compost is dry and you mentioned moisture is important and the ratio from green to brown is one to three, um, could we water the compost? Yeah, definitely. Like for sure. Like if you have a rain barrel and it, it definitely, I know that the rain has not been very prevalent the past little bit. But you, if your rain barrel still has some leftover, you can just definitely add some. And if you have an outdoor compost and it's it's well drained, so you probably, I wouldn't add like a ton, but even if you add a little bit too much, it'll drain through. Yeah, I would definitely recommend adding a little bit of water if you think your compost is pretty dry. Mm. Or maybe even moving it to a shady spot under a tree if you don't want to kind of keep checking on it with by watering it. If you can move it to a slightly less sunny part, that could help as well. This is an interesting question. Someone's asking, so if the goal is to reduce your methane emissions um, and the green cone digester 
produces a lot of methane. Is it really that much better than sending it to the landfill? Um, I mean, if you're not harvesting it for energy, so uh, I wish I could remember the name of this company in London. Oh, but you know, I was thinking there's Tri Recycling. I know they make compost. There's also another one, um, Renui. They just changed their name to Convertis, I think, or can, yes. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But they definitely do renewing. Yes, I've talked to them and they do that type of composting. So, yeah, if, if you don't have some sort of fancy converter at home to like harvest some of that methane and use it as some sort of energy. Yeah, it's not super great um, to do at home. But yeah, it's mainly just these bigger companies and if you go on their website or probably talk to them, I know their their rules about what can go in their compost are so different because they really they I think they almost want very little brown because they want that more organic stuff to produce more methane. So that's another thing to keep in mind if you're want to like bring some of your compost to some of these places. But yeah, I wouldn't. It's more of a fun tidbit that you could. You can harvest the energy from composting to do other things, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and I was thinking with the green cone digester, at least it's still less waste going to landfill. So you're not filling the landfill as quickly and not filling the garbage trucks as quickly and all that. For sure. Every little bit helps. Exactly. And I don't think the cone digester is fully anoxic. It's, it's just because it's like, the way it's built with the two layers, it, it's just really hot. So it basically just like everything gets hot and turns to like liquid and kind of drains out from my understanding. Okay, some really good questions I think um, that I was wondering too. Can you put paper towels and Kleenex in the compost? Um, I've never come across anyone saying like a company saying no to those so I think so because it should be fine I wouldn't that would count as brown material and so make sure your brown to green ratio is okay but I think if it's for your at home composting I don't see much harm in it um you could probably check um the label and stuff like that to see if there's plastic in it but I think it's fine. I just, I would introduce a little bit at a time. Don't go crazy and start dumping it all in. But I, I don't see any issue with it. Maybe it depends on what you want to do with the end product too. Like if you're just using it to feed your, your trees and your ornamentals versus food that you're going to be eating or something. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's a good point as well. Yeah, it, it's not adding a lot of nutrients to the system. That's a really good point. Um, I've heard you should avoid putting citrus in like lemons or oranges because of the acid. Is that true or is it okay to put them in? Um, it's definitely true. Like um, acidity is, um, if it's, things are too acidic, decomposition doesn't really occur. But um, you can put in a little bit and I would definitely recommend cutting it off. But I do and it's okay, but if you just want to be careful of your quantity there because if you are actually changing the pH of the whole system by including the peel of some acidic fruits, then maybe, but I wouldn't worry too much if it's like you have a couple oranges a week, it should be okay depending on the size of your composter. But yeah, pH is definitely a factor that plays into the decomposition process as well. Someone mentioned computer paper, cutting that up. Is that okay? Yeah, again, I think it's fine. I wouldn't add a ton. Not adding a lot of value, like nutritional value to your composter, but it, it should break down easy enough. It should be okay. Maybe pay attention to ink. There's a lot of ink on it, but yeah, it should be fine. Again, it's trial and error, a little bit here, a little bit there. See how things go. So similarly, that'll probably be your answer, but someone mentioned they bought some decomposing pellets from Rona. Um, do you know anything about those or if they're helpful? I do not. I do not. I wonder, 
I wonder if it's like some sort of like slow releasing nutrients or something because it wouldn't be living like micro arthropods and living microbes so it might just be like a slow release fertilizer type thing with some nitrogen or phosphorus that's slowly leaching into the system mm -hmm. that's what i would imagine they are okay Someone said they bought composted earth from the city and there were all kinds of materials in it. Um, and so I guess she's concerned about what might be in it, but does that break down okay? Um, yeah, she's seeing little bits of plastic. It's, it's not great, but it's part of the reason why a lot of London hasn't yet moved towards this um, citywide composting program yet is it's hard to make sure it's not contaminated because plastic's kind of everywhere. I mean, you don't, it's not ideal to introduce plastic to the natural environment, but I mean, if it's not too much, it's there. I don't know what else you would do with it and how you would get, remove the plastic bits. It's, it's, I don't think it'll like harm your plants or anything like that. It's just generally bad for the environment to have plastic out there. So it would really depend on how much. I hope there's not too much because that'd be very disheartening. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess they're probably getting it from the leaf litter that gets picked up by the city. Well, I yeah. guess in a couple of years we'll have a green bin program and they'll probably sell that as well. So there may be a learning curve as people learn what to put and what to not put in it. <laughs> That'll be interesting. Um, what about growing vegetables on top of your compost pile? I mean, if you can seed them and they do it and they like it, that's great. Um, I could imagine a lot because when you think about your composting pile, right, like it's in that process of recycling those nutrients. So all the nutrients are kind of locked in this organic material and the microbes are breaking it down and releasing that nitrogen again, right? So if your compost is kind of still in that process of the microbes breaking it down, a lot of the nitrogen is locked within the microbes. So the microbes are actually taking in all the nitrogen and all the phosphorus, right? So there might not be that much nutrients available for the plants to uptake, but it really depends on the stage. And so, I mean, if it works, it works, that's great. But I would definitely try to let your compost get to that dark, rich phase where the nutrients are more available for plant uptake. Yeah, so he also added, is it safe to do it before stuff is broken down? So that makes me think another problem might be if there's, you know, aphids, just insects, little, little decomposers, you may not want to expose your plants to those. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely a possibility as well. But that's why you try to think about what you're putting in your compost, right? Because ultimately what you put in your compost and what you use your compost for, right? It's things don't necessarily disappear. So if you're your houseplant died because it's covered in aphids, maybe don't introduce that to your compost, that type of thing, right? So it'll break down and it'll be fine, but then if you were to go and like put that compost on your garden, you might run into some problems there. All right, so one minute and one question left. What to do with um, your compost or if you don't have a garden and plants? So. I guess it's kind of if you just are an apartment dweller, what kinds of things would you put in it to make sure you have all the right ratios? Oh, what types of things would you put in it? Again, egg cartons, eggs, um, some paper is fine too if you need some of that brown material. And yeah, that would be my suggestion. There's probably some better ones out there, but that's a good starting point. You can definitely find other types of brown material. It doesn't necessarily have to be yard waste, but yard waste is a big one for people who are outside. But yeah, you should be able to like find some other brown stuff through your normal everyday cooking habits, such as paper and eggs and egg um, shells and egg cartons. Those are good ones. 
Well, that's great. Well, that's it for the questions. Oh, what about toilet paper rolls? Okay, that'll be the last one. And then if you have any other questions after that, you can always reach out to um, Tree. There's their contact information there. Um, and um, I'm sure on their website too, we have a lot of resources. For sure. Yeah, exactly. You can reach out and internet is a plethora of places and to find information about composting. I mean, I wouldn't put all of your toilet paper rolls in your composter, but if you want to, if you have a vermin compost, especially cut it up, use that as some of the bedding material, it'll work fine. Adding one every once in a while, it'll be okay. Again, it's not adding too much nutritional value to your compost, but it does count as some of that brown material. So yeah, again, it's a little bit of trial and error. Try a little bit of this if it works, that's great. Things like that. Yeah, all right. I want to give a shout out to uh, Giada, who's been in the background typing a lot of answers to some of the specific questions as well. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody for coming out. I'm so happy to see so many people being interested in learning. Uh, and it's so great to have you, Caitlin, tonight and to all the tree organizers for making this happen. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank you to Rainforest London for putting this on and helping all these environmental groups collaborate together during these new and interesting times. It's great to see. Yeah, if people have a bit of extra time, why not start a new hobby, whether it's composting, biking to work. And... Great. All right. Well, if that's everything, I will sign off. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night. Okay. Bye, everyone. Go up to your composters.